with that, I want to, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce <clears throat> Cantor Phil Barron, um, who is our own uh, senior cantor at Valley Best Shalom. He's the son of a violinist and the grandson of a Vilna rabbi, uh, and had a, a career in children's entertainment, including on Disney, where he wrote uh, nearly 200 songs. I, and uh, um, Cantor Phil has invited a couple of colleagues to join him today in a special program, The Jewish Voice in American Folk Music. Cantor, it's all yours. Bill, I'm not hearing you. Probably want to unmute. How about now? <laughs> yes, got it. Okay, good. I keep forgetting this has a magic button on it. Uh, it's a pretty cool looking mic, but you have to remember to turn it on. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Joel. Um, if you're wondering why we're doing this particular program, originally on May 17th, we had scheduled the fourth in a series of programs that feature the American voice in Jewish folk music. It occurred to me some years ago that there are just, and it's pretty obvious, there are so many uh, Jewish songwriters and performers uh, in the folk tradition. I'll just name a few of them. I mean, uh, other than the obvious Bob Dylan and Phil Oakes and Paul Simon and Leonard Cohn, uh, you have people going back to the 1950s, Fred Hellerman from the Weavers, Lou Gottlieb and Alex Hasselev from the Limelighters. Theodore Bikel is another obvious one. Peter Yarrow from Peter, Paul, and Mary. Many people didn't know he was Jewish. John Cohn from the New Lost City Ramblers uh, and many, many others. And there's a particular a kind of um, voice, uh, uh, an expression that comes from the Jewish soul that I think is found in a lot of the, the music of, of the folk uh, tradition. Now, I, I wanna start out with a song today and this is a song that was written by a composer who is not Jewish, a guy by the name of Pete Seeger. You may have heard of him, one of the giants of the folk music, particularly of the 1950s and 60s, and probably even going back to the 40s. He wrote a song. Uh, it's a collaboration with a Jewish writer. And I wonder if you can identify the name of this famous lyricist. <clears throat> time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to laugh, a time to weep. Do everything a season turn, 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 and the time to every purpose under heaven. A time to build up, a time to break down, a time to dance, a time to mourn, a time to cast away stones. A time to gather stones together To everything turn, turn, turn There is a season turn, turn, turn And the time So who can identify the, uh, the lyricist? Anybody out there? I'll, you can unmute if you know the answer. 
Ecclesiastes from the Bible. Ah, you got, it. got it. It's uh, Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, and actually attributed to King Solomon. So there's an old lyric for you. So uh, I wonder how an old lyric, uh, about at least 2,500 years old uh, and possibly older, comes to be set to music by a 20th century composer and it brings up the issue of what is folk music. So I'm gonna ask a couple of experts. My guests today uh, are a wellspring of information about the folk tradition, folk music tradition. Art Podell uh, was described as Will Rogers with an Ivy League education. He is one of the earliest folk singers to come out of Greenwich Village, uh, out of that scene in the late 50s and early 60s. He was among the first to sign with the seminal folk division of Columbia Records. Uh, he was also a member of the New Christie Minstrels. It's safe to say that Art uh, is an important trailblazer on the American folk scene, and he's still blazing. He's still writing songs and teaching us about the essential messages of folk and its impact on our culture. He hosts a regular show every other month on KPFK called Roots Music and Beyond. And he writes a regular column for folkworks.org, which uh, reaches about a half a million um, monthly readers and contains a lot of information about current folk music and dance activity in Southern California, something you might want to check out. Art was introduced to me by um, the other gentleman joining us today, David Budin. David is a singer, songwriter, and journalist who has written extensively for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's been editor of Cleveland Magazine and Northern Ohio Live. He's a founding member of the folk group Long Road, whose motto is making old songs new and new songs sound old. He's a native Clevelander. David, uh, however, moved to New York at the age of 18 and within a year was producing multiple artists for Sire Records and others. I know this amazing fact is true because we've been friends and bandmates and colleagues for over 50 years. So David, let me start with you with that question. What is folk music? Well, let me uh, go back to Pete Seeger. Uh, when people used to ask him who wrote folk songs, he would say folks. <laughs> okay. Because that's great. You know, um, the songs that we call traditional, the only reason they're traditional and other songs aren't is because we don't know who wrote those songs. You know, if we knew who wrote them, they wouldn't be traditional, they'd be by so-and-so. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it's sort of impossible to define what folk music is, except that it's not classical music and it's not jazz. Other than that, anything can turn into a folk song later. Because a lot of the things that we call folk songs, maybe all of them, were written by somebody. I mean, you know they were written by humans. You know, somebody <laughs> wrote them. They didn't just appear. Right. So somebody wrote them and people started singing them. And uh, if people keep singing them long enough, they become folk songs, I guess. Interesting. Uh, Art, do you have another answer to that? Well, I, I, I think the answer to that might be um, the fact is if, if you wait long enough, anything becomes a folk song. Um, I, I gave, when we had a, a preliminary discussion, they gave the example of some of the music of the 50s, uh, which was clearly constructed for commercial purposes, all of the little teenage, you know, I love you songs and I'm going to the prom. But, you know, 100 years from now, they're going to look back at that and say, well, here's a folk song from the 50s, uh, back in the 20th century. And um, it'll all be cataloged, you know, the composers will all have been long gone, the royalties will have expired, they'll all be part of the, the lexicon of public domain, and somebody like a future day, Alan Lomax, will go out and collect them and uh, put them into an anthology and say the folk music of the 1950s and the 20th century. And, right. there, and there they'll be, all of the songs that we used to hate and love. <laughs> but the, there's something about the folk music uh, of the 50s and 60s that we're talking about today and, yes. and beyond uh, that has a certain uh, a character to it. C can you uh, think back to some of the earliest songs you might have learned as a young uh, musician? 
Yes, I mean, there was an entire lexicon of music that had been dug out of the mountains and was just entering the cities. I think that was probably when I first started hanging around Greenwich Village uh, in my high school years in the late 50s um, and early college years, because I went to college in Manhattan. And, um, and uh, hanging around the village, people were eagerly grabbing all of the stuff that had been brought to the cities by uh, young folk singers like Pete Seeger, by uh, Pete Seeger's uh, sister, uh, Peggy Seeger and Mike. Um, and uh, those early, early people, even, I mean, even actors like Alan Arkin were folk singers. And uh, they would come to the village and sit in Washington Square and say, listen to this song I just learned. I remember the first day somebody brought O Sinner Man to the city. Everybody sang it for a month. Um, I don't think it ever stopped. There was always somebody singing O Sinner Man somewhere in Greenwich Village. So um, what were some of those uh, early uh, hangouts for folk musicians in the village? Um, Cafe Wa, Gaslight, uh, Gertie's Folk City, the, uh, the Village Gate, um, endless coffee shops. We were just evolving from the beat generation where it was coffee, turtlenecks, and anger. Um, and uh, it was emerging and evolving into, uh, listen to this, what I've just heard, and listen to this. And uh, ad hoc groups getting together in Washington Square on Sunday morning uh, and su all day Sunday afternoon, just singing the songs to each other. It was a, it was a time of discovery. Um, the whole concept of publishing and making money um, was not in the minds of all of us young folk singers. It was in the minds of some. And God bless them for what they went ahead and did because they brought it to the public. Right. But, um, but, uh, but, but that's what it was. It was an era of discovery. And even the song like, you know, Turn, Turn. I mean, you know, the, these are songs that, you know, had been bit, buried and hidden in, in archives. Uh, and uh, people like Alan Lomax, Pete Seeger, the Weavers, um, who did have a commercial uh, uh, intent in, in, in their in their activities. Um, we're bringing them to the cities and small concert venues. Town Hall, which is an adjunct of Carnegie Hall that held fewer people, hosted ca uh, concerts. The uh, local Baha'i Temple hosted concerts when somebody of uh, Pete Seeger's stature came to town. Right. Or Bob so um, uh, could from, you from Chicago. Would you mind playing uh, a, a tune for us uh, from that early Period. Well, I'd, l I'd love to. In fact, when we discussed it, I thought of one tune that, that's kind of ironic. Because when I first got to the village, um, when I first came to Greenwich Village, uh, one of the songs that I fell in love with was a song that Bob Gibson was singing. And I was convinced that it was a folk song because it had all the, all, all the trappings of a folk song. And it's the perfect example uh, of what we're talking about. Um, can you see me on the screen? Yes, we, we've got you. You got me? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a perfect song because I thought it was a folk song and I loved it and I learned it and I sang it and Peter Yarrow sang it. I remember him singing it. I remember Noel singing it. And this is before Peter, Paul and Mary. We were all just individual kids coming into the village. And, um, and I only found out about two years ago that it had been written for a Broadway show to my shock and horror. But to me, it's still a folk song. Okay, you ready for it? It's called Absolutely. Copper Kettle. I don't know how many people know it, but it was one of my favorite folk songs. Copper Kettle. Time. You hear the guitar? Great. Get you a copper kettle. Get you a copper coil. Cover with new moon corn mash. And never more need your toil. You just lay there by the juniper while the moon shines bright. Watch them jugs a filling in the pale moonlight. Build your fire of hickory, hickory ash and oak. Don't use no green or rotten woods. They'll find you by your smoke. 
And you lay there by the juniper While the moon shines bright Watch them jugs of filling in the pale moonlight. My daddy made whiskey, my granddaddy did too. We ain't paid no whiskey tax since 1792. We just lay there by the juniper While the moon shines bright Watch them jugs of filling Ah, so moving. What a beautiful tune. Written in 1953 for a Broadway show. I just found out I was <laughs> horrified. Here I thought I was rescuing a folk song from the back hills of the Ozarks, but it goes to show you. Here's a folk song. And we used to say this. Here's a folk song I just wrote that's 500 years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Sure, you bet. So I've got a question for David. We've, uh, we've talked a, a little bit, uh, touched on uh, some of the songwriters from the era, but it wasn't just the folk, uh, the, the writers and the performers and composers who made the folk movement happen. There were researchers and other people uh, who, who did like the Lomaxes, who did uh, a lot of work to bring forward some of that music, but there were also the managers very soon who came along and the executives and the record companies. Could you talk about that a little bit and what the Jewish influence was there, David? Right, there's a, a whole big bunch of Jews that uh, <laughs> with, without whom, um, without whom the, the, all these folk singers probably would just have stayed in uh, Washington Square Park and sung for each other. But there's a, a bunch in no particular order um, one of the most important was a guy named Moses Ash, A-S-C-H, known as Mo Ash. And he started uh, Ash Records, uh, turned into Folkways Records, and he did some of the earliest uh, uh, recordings of uh, Woody Guthrie and Lead Belly, uh, Pete Seeger, Cisco Houston. And uh, the most important thing he did was, um, and he didn't do it, he just put it out. A guy named Harry Smith, who was a filmmaker in California, um, this is kind of a weird thing. He, he took existing recordings from the 20s and 30s, 40s maybe, from his own collection and made copies of them and put 84 of them together. And these were all different uh, kinds of roots, what we now call roots music. Uh, folk music and cowboy songs and sea shanties and blues and, and he put them into a collection called the Harry Smith Collection. It was originally called the Harry Smith Collection um, and put out this this record and uh, it became the uh, the folk singers Bible in a way and everybody learned those songs and uh, hmm. eventually Ash um, Folkways Records was taken over by the Smithsonian um, and w with the stipulation, he gave it to the Smithsonian with the stipulation that um, they couldn't drop and eliminate any of the recordings. Uh, so they're, they're, they're still available. The Smithsonian put them out and they have them in their archives and, uh, and that includes the Harry Smith collection. So it uh Folk music could have stayed within the realm of, uh, you know, historical tunes that had kind of uh, bubbled up uh, in different traditions around America, but instead it suddenly made a leap into the, the popular world. How did that happen? Well, I think a big part of that was, uh, you mentioned managers before. Yeah. There were a couple of um, 
managers of folk musicians, so the, the, the main two managers, I think. Um, the, first of all, there was Harold Leventhal, who managed the Weavers and uh, Judy Collins and, and a few other people. And Pete Seeger came out of the Weavers. Pete Seeger, yes. Um, and I, I should point out, too, since you did Turn, 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 Pete Seeger was not Jewish, but he was involved in every single one of these things that I'm going to talk about. He was just there. Um, he was sort of like, uh, what's his name in the movie? Uh, uh, Zelig. Tom, Tom, no, Tom, oh, Tom Hanks. Uh, oh, that yeah, guy. that guy. <laughs> um, just, just involved in everything. Uh, but the other guy was Albert Grossman. Started out as a club owner, a folk club owner in Chicago, the Gate of Horn. Um, started booking, helping to book uh, the very first Newport Folk Festival. Well, I'll, I'll get off track right here. <laughs> Newport Folk Festival was another one of the, the main things that helped spread the word. And that was um, it, produced by a guy named George Wine or Ween, um, who owned a jazz club. So he brought in Albert Grossman to help book the Newport Folk Festival. Um, the Albert Grossman started managing Odetta and a couple of people, but then he put together Peter, Paul, and Mary, and he, right around the same time, started managing Bob Dylan and several others, hmm. and he really pushed everybody to write their own songs. Uh, they all found out later, like 30 years later, that he had this secret agreement with the publishing company at Warner Brothers, Whitmark Publishing, to, to get some of their money from publishing. Uh -huh. So that I'm not going to say it was, but it might have been a motivation of his to get them to start writing. So that, that um, he would have, and he managed Bob Dylan, am I right? Right. Yeah. So, so. Bob Dylan's first album uh, only had two original songs on it. Uh, and then the second album was all, I mean, from then on, it was all originals. And that was the album Free Wheelin' Bob Dylan. That was the right. album that that just rocked the world, <laughs> and including me, by the way. Right. And it was a it was a huge influence, and I listened to it over and over and over again. Um, uh, I'm sort I of think thinking like we we could use a song right now, David. Have you got a Dylan song? Uh, yes, I have a couple. Um, when Dylan started out, when he was a kid, or maybe you know high school college age he uh for just fell in love with folk music and go we'd go and uh listen to all of his friends all of his friends who had albums all of their stuff and he stole a lot of them and took them with him um and you know a, a, the traditional way to write a folk song in, a, in many cases was to take what was happening in the world in the news and uh, just write a song about that. And often, like in Woody Guthrie's case and Lead Belly and others, you would just take an existing melody and write new words to it. You, it wasn't like you were stealing. You were just, that was the folk tradition. You would, you know, write a topical song about that. So anyway, here's a song. Uh, Dylan sang at the, the March on Washington, you know, with uh, where Martin Luther King gave his um, I Have a Dream speech, and uh, Joan Baez sang, and uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. And on the way back, that was August uh, 63, I guess. On the way back from that event, he read an article um, about this thing that happened and immediately wrote a song about it. It was one, this was one of his earliest, uh, so, you know, topical songs. And it was on his third album. And it goes like this. And it, everything in it is true. He changed a couple t little tiny minor things, but it's, it's really, he was sort of like a reporter, you know, a musical reporter. <laughs> William Zansinger killed poor Hattie Carroll with a cane that he twirled round his diamond ring finger at a Baltimore hotel society gathering and the cops were called in and his weapon took from him 
as they rode him in custody down to the station and booked Williams and Zinger for first degree murder. But you who philosophize disgrace and criticize all fears, take the rag away from your face. Now ain't the time for your tears. Williams and Singer, who at 24 years owns a tobacco farm of 600 acres with rich, wealthy parents who provide and protect him and high office relations in the politics of Maryland reacted to his deed with a shrug of his shoulders and swear words and sneering and his tongue it was snarling in a matter of minutes on bail was out walking but you who philosophize disgrace and criticize all fears Take the rag away from your face and Now ain't the time for your tears Hattie Carroll was a maid of the kitchen She was 51 years old and gave birth to 10 children She carried the dishes and took out the garbage and never once sat at the head of the table and didn't even talk to the people at the table she just cleaned up all of the food at the table and emptied the ashtrays on a whole other level got killed by a blow lay slain by a cane that sailed through the air and came down through the room doomed and determined to destroy all the gentle and she never done nothing to Williams and Zinger but you who philosophize disgrace and criticize all fears take the rag away from your face now ain't the time for your tears in the courtroom of honor the judge pounded his gavel to show that all's equal and the courts are on the level and that the strings in the books ain't pulled and persuaded and that even the nobles get properly handled once that the cops have chased after and caught him and the ladder of the law has no top and no bottom stared at the person who killed for no reason who just happened to be feeling that way without warning and he spoke through his cloak most deep and distinguished and handed out strongly for penalty and repentance Williams and Zinger with a six-month sentence and you who philosophize disgrace and criticize all fears take the red away from your face for now is the time for your tears wow powerful song of dylan's that i wasn't familiar with uh you know, he was a kid he was young yeah i mean it's a, it tells an incredible story a true story with biting social protest within it sort of couched within it Right. I mean, uh, you know, if you want to look for the Jewish voice, <clears throat> it's right there with Tzedek, Tzedek, Tir Dof, you know, justice you shall pursue. Right. Uh, he, took it, he took that very seriously. Art, I want to uh, jump back to you 
with a question about the, again, about the early days. I know Dylan was certainly a part of that playing around the village. You mentioned a name earlier in passing, and I, I have a feeling that most of our audience wouldn't know who you were talking about when you said Noel. Who were you talking about there? Um, Noel Paul Stuckey. Uh, uh -huh. from, so from Peter, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Another words. Yeah, well, when I first entered Café Wa, I came in with a partner of mine that I had met actually at Camp Rama. Uh, for those of us out here who remember Camp Rama, that Camp Rama is still probably in existence, but it was the, uh, the summer adjunct of the Jewish Theological Seminary. And, still, uh, still, was, still very, very active. And I was a yeshiva boy, and of course I went to uh, Camp Rama. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Yeshiva of Flatbush, along with uh, um, Alan Dershowitz and uh, Dennis Prager, two other graduates of my high school. Right. <laughs> um, anyway, um, um, I, was, uh, I was at Camp Ramah and I met a fellow by the name of Paul Potash and Paul and I became a duet and we, we signed to Columbia Records. And when we hit the village, we, uh, I had actually been in the village for quite a while, but when Paul entered my life, we got out of the army, we formed a duet, and we got signed immediately to Columbia Records. And I forgot the question. Uh, well, the question was about Peter, Paul, and Mary, actually. Well, of course, we went, Café Wa was our main, our, our main performance uh, stage, and Peter had just come from Cornell, he was there. Um, uh, I needed to replace myself in a Jewish folk dance group and I taught Peter all of the Hebrew songs that we were singing and he took my place in the folk dance group and, um, and Noel was the MC at the Café Wa because he's an incredible comedian with a wonderful talent for folk singing and, uh, and that, that was then. Mary was off in a different world. She was part of a different uh, group in the village that I was familiar with because I was in the village. And, uh, uh, and this is an apocryphal story, but I remember the, the, the day Peter uh, Yarrow and I sat in Mineta's Tavern directly across from the Cafe Wa, and Peter said, Albert Grossman wants to put together a trio and he's got me and Noel and we're looking for a girl. He wants a blonde who can sing folk songs. Wow. And I looked at him and I took a napkin and I said, you know, last week I saw a group called the Tune Tellers, Ralph Rinsler and uh, Alan Arkin and a whole bunch of folk singers. There was this girl singing. Her name was Mary Travers. And I wrote it down on a napkin and gave it to Peter. And I said, I would look her up if I were you. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no idea if that napkin ended up on the barroom floor uh, <laughs> 10 minutes later or what. But uh, that's my story. And wow. um, Peter and I are still friends, but we haven't touched that subject yet. And that's incredible. And uh, you did the first version of Puff the Magic Dragon, am I right? Well, their manager, Albert Grossman, when they formed, uh, felt that Puff the Magic Dragon might be too controversial because of its implication as a song about pot, about marijuana. Mm -hmm. So Peter came to our apartment on Fifth Street and Second Avenue, Paul and myself, and gave us that song. And he said, I'd love for you guys to sing it because we were, we had just released an album on Columbia and we were getting set to do a US tour. And we sang Puff the Magic Dragon across the United States for a full year and then some before Peter, Paul and Mary recorded it. Of course, the restriction was that we couldn't record it because they were holding it in abeyance uh, for Albert to make a decision. And I remember the night at the Troubadour when we were about to get on stage and, went, and sing Puff the Magic Dragon again, when the phone, the, uh, the, the stage manager handed me the black telephone that was on the wall next to the stage of the Troubadour. And it was Peter Yarrow telling me, Artie, he said, Albert decided that we're going to record this song, so you guys can't record it. I said, well, thanks. After we made it a national treasure, you know, of <laughs> oh, course, man. national treasure meant, made, meant we made it popular in four coffee houses and one university. <laughs> but to me, that was a national treasure. But anyway, oh. it's been one of my fondest memories. And there's a recording of it that somebody did of us doing a concert in Boulder, Colorado, with Art and Paul singing Puff the Magic Dragon, close wow. to two years before it was recorded by Peter and, uh, and Mary. You can find it on YouTube. It's just Art and Paul 
Puff the Magic Dragon. By the way, I just want to mention the first two Art and Paul albums were re-released by Sony Music uh, last June. Uh, and they're available. For any Art and Paul fans out there who remember it, uh, it's now available on all of the places where people go, like Spotify and um, all, all of those funny, funny named uh, music, music great. sources. Oh, wonderful. Good. Great to know. And uh, I'm just wondering, could you play one of your tunes for us? Yes, I'd love to. I'm going to invite my, my wonderful wife, Judy, who I uh, was fortunate enough to hook up with somebody who has perfect pitch. And uh, <laughs> I'm not going to waste the opportunity. This is Judy. Slide Hi, Judy. Up, Hello. Nice to see you again. And, and I'm going to sing a song really that kind of commemorates, I, I know we discussed another song, but this one popped into my head this morning. And this commemorates my trip with Paul to California. And uh, we, uh, we shed you know, Columbia wasn't too happy about our second album, uh, and uh, we didn't know where to go. We figured, let's go to California. So this is a song about that. Okay, here we go. Traveled all alone across this wide and open country Running from the long years, looking back on helpless times Packed up all our songs and the memories inside them Slipped the keys into the mailbox, left yesterday behind Just a dinker dog and Paul, an old Martin and a banjo Chevy engine rumbling like a rusty old train. A box of donuts, some coffee, they'll get you past Chicago. Setting sun to guide you through the thunder and the rain. And we sang our songs, songs in California as we stood on that long Pacific shore. Sang our songs in California and they sounded like they sounded when we sang them all before and we felt young and free like we felt before down to route 66 past the mountains west of denver camp out in the desert where it meets the great divide Stop when we were hungry just to sing for our summer. Drop a dime on double zero to let them know we tried. And we sang our songs in California as we stood on that long Pacific shore. Sang our songs in California and they sounded like they sounded when we sang them all before and we felt young and free like we felt before do you believe there's promise for the dreamer do you believe this song can be his prayer well i believe the music was waiting for us there in the promise of the sunrise reaching down a sleepy canyon the mighty ocean waters crashing down upon the sand in a shooting star above you that whispers in the silence you can find your dreams here you can hold them in your hand and we Sang our songs in California as we stood along that long Pacific shore. Sang our songs in California and they sounded like they sounded when we sang them all before. And we felt young and free. Like we 
felt before Love that art. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. you know, I, wrote there's that. A, I wrote that about five, ten years ago, and it's on my CD. Great. <laughs> Great. Good. Everybody go out and get the CD. You know, there's, there's something, there's a parallel between that Dylan song and this, and that there, it's, a, it's storytelling, and it's, it's truth-telling from the heart. And I think that's one of the other characteristics of folk music, is there's something that is personal and yet universal about that because we can well, all relate to that kind of uh, experience that's the trick and sometimes we get lucky don't we <laughs> yeah got, got lucky with that one uh want to uh, take it back to david for a moment um we had talked about earlier some of the other jewish folk singers and uh as i mentioned earlier david and i have known each other for a very long time and we both uh, were um, people who hung out at a folk club in Cleveland called La Cave. It was down uh, underneath a bank, actually, in Cleveland near University Circle. And uh, I was fortunate that my cousin was one of the owners and he used to let me in when I was underage. And, uh, and uh, they had wonderful uh, people performing there like Judy Collins and Gordon Lightfoot and Jose Feliciano and uh, many, many others. And, and, and Art and Paul. Well. Art and Paul, Art and Paul were there. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't, didn't know that, Art. <clears throat> uh, about what year were you there? I would say, I would say um, 1960, 61. Uh -huh. And we brought an accompany was, accompanist with us to that particular gig was Bernie Krause, who eventually replaced Pete Seeger in The Weavers. No kidding. Oh, amazing. So the owner unfortunately passed away very recently. Stan Kane uh, was my cousin. But... Uh, one of the most memorable nights I had there was seeing Phil Oaks. And uh, I've, I've never seen a, a crowd get that excited. And they, they literally would not let him leave. He had encore after encore. It was at least four encores that night. Uh, it was really very moving and amazing. And David, I wonder if you would do a Phil Oaks tune for us. Uh, yes. And actually, it might be a good time to mention a couple of the other big the big Jews in folk music at the time because they both uh, Phil Oaks um, they in they didn't influence him he they helped him along um, I'll just quickly mention Izzy Young Israel Young who owned the Folklore Center which was this little storefront place sold books and records all about folk music right in the heart of the village and uh, people like you know, kids at the time, like Phil Oaks and Bob Dylan, you would hang out there and meet each other, you know, all the other folk singers and uh, make connections. Dave Van Ronk used to hang out there. That's where Dave Van Ronk met Bob Dylan, and he was a big influence on Dylan. And, uh, hmm. and where and was that, it exactly, David? The Folklore Center? It was right it was in on New York. McDougal in Street. Greenwich in Village in McDougal and like Bleecker and McDougal. You know, Bleecker and McDougal was sort of the... the Part of the place. I think Cafe Wa was on another corner of Bleaker and McDougal. Right. That's right. Yeah. Correct. And the Minetta Tavern was a catty corner, uh, you know, diagonally right. across. Minetta's, Minetta, Minetta Way was uh, the, this little teeny cobblestone street that crept away from Bleaker. Right. Huh. Um, so that was, that was one thing. Another important, really important, um, step was the uh, Sing Out magazine, which was uh, started by Irwin Silber in 1950. And in their first, I don't know, six years or something, they published 400 brand new songs by, well, not in the 50s, but l later on in the 60s, by, by Phil Oaks and Bob Dylan and all those guys. Um, so that was a monthly publication, was it? Uh, I'm not sure if it was monthly. It might have been quarterly or bi-monthly, uh -huh. but it, it was it, it it's still around actually online. Erwin Silber is long gone, uh -huh. but um, so Sing Out magazine and the Folklore Center, Bob Dylan and Phil Oaks both, um, you know, uh, 
use utilize both of those uh, resources. And that's uh, how that's how you spread music in those days. In particular, print music was right. a great way for music to get out into the public. And there were a lot of people who didn't like Tom Paxton was playing around the village for many years before he actually got signed to a record deal. And he, he was writing all of his own songs before anybody was, before Dylan and everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, Phil Oaks, you mentioned Phil Oaks. Um, this is, uh, he, he was probably the most prolific uh, protest songwriter of the 60s. And all of a sudden, there was a lot to protest in the 60s. There was uh, all these burgeoning movements like the civil rights movement, uh, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, environment, you know, American Indian, everything um, suddenly became a movement. So there were, was a lot for all these guys to say. So, uh, and I should also point out that Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger and others did write songs before the so-called singer-songwriter era, but they sang them to hobo camps for 40 people and factory workers for 30 people and you know but now in the 60s all of a sudden people could make records and go on the radio and yeah and hit millions of people anyway this is one of phil oaks's oh wait i keep interrupting myself eventually <laughs> i will do the song um phil oaks uh this is a good example of how and what phil oaks learned from woody guthrie's songwriting and a good example is This Land is Your Land, which Art Podell, down there in the corner of my screen, um, actually had a big hit record with, with the uh, New Christie Minstrels. <clears throat> um, and everybody, every, every kid in school learned the first three verses of uh, This Land is Your Land. Um, but there were a couple of verses that people didn't sing much uh, that were kind of uh, subversive and, you know, I mean, not to me they weren't, but to some people they were about um, just, uh, they were uh, critical, you know, of, of the government. And when people at, would ask Phil Oaks, you know, why do you, why do you hate this country so much? He would say, I, I don't hate the country. It's like if you have, if you have a child and you discipline them and criticize them. And it's not because you hate them, it's because you love them and want to improve them. So that's, um, so he wrote all these, all these protest songs and here is one. I'll, um, I'll do it fast because I talked a lot. Um, it's called Power and the Glory. Come on and take a walk with me through this green and growing land. Walk through the meadows, the mountains and the sand. Walk through the valleys, the rivers and the plains. Walk through the sun and walk through the rain. Here is a land full of power and glory, beauty that words cannot recall. Oh, her power shall rest on the strength of her freedom. Her glory shall rest on us all. From Colorado, Kansas, Carolinas too, Virginia and Alaska, from the old to the new, Texas and Ohio, the California shore. Tell me who could ask for more? Here is a land full of power and glory, beauty that words cannot recall. Oh, her power shall rest on the strength of her freedom, her glory shall rest on us all. Yet she's only as free, rich as the poorest of her poor, only as free as the padlocked prison door. Only as strong as our love for this land Only as strong as we stand Here is a land full of power and glory Beauty that words cannot recall 
Oh, her power shall rest on the strength of her freedom. Her glory shall rest on us all. Come on and take a walk with me through this green and growing land. Walk through the meadows, the mountains and the sand. Walk through the valleys, the rivers and the plains. Walk through the sun and walk through the rain. Here is a land full of power and glory, beauty that words cannot recall. Oh, her power shall rest on the strength of her freedom. Her glory shall rest on us all, on us all. Ah, love that song. And you know, the, the, the themes are still very much present in uh, society today, those questions, right. about, uh, really questions about justice again. So Joel, I'm going to uh, take it back to you because uh, I think there might be some questions. Yes. Well, first of all, this was fabulous, fabulous. Um, I, mean, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm choked up. Um, are there any questions or comments for uh, three entertainers today? I, I have, if I, if I may. <laughs> yes, Phil. Number one, uh, Phil Barron, what you have been doing the last couple of months mm -hmm. to help keep this community together and vibrant and connected, you, the clergy, the staff of EBS, you guys have been extraordinary, number one. Number two, I want to thank you personally for, for agreeing to go ahead with this particular program. And I want to thank David and Art for joining in. I want to thank Phil for getting them out of whatever they were doing <laughs> to come <laughs> do this for an hour with us because you guys have all just lifted us out of the the world that we're currently dealing with and all the all the difficulties that so many of us are having and 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 all the all the misery that's out there and just brought us back to a to a wonderful place for an hour and Lots of memories, I'm sure, for everybody else who's watching. It's and, the great uh, thing about music, Bill. You know, we, we, we appreciate everything you guys did for the last hour. And Phil, you've been amazing for the last couple of months. You and the, the crew that's supporting you are just, we really appreciate it. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. It's the great thing about music, right? Takes, takes, takes you out of your space. <laughs> as small well, as it I have be. a question. How, when will the next folk singer win a Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> or or a Nobel Prize as we call it now. A Nobel, that's right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask one more time. Yes, Barbara, can you unmute yourself? I'm, I'm going to give it to Lynn. I think he wanted. Well, I just to wonder if you could recommend any contemporary folk song, folk singers. There are um, there are many. Um, there's a few that I, I really love. Um, Cheryl Wheeler is one, W-H-E-E-L-E-R. Mm -hmm. uh, John Gorka, G-O-R-K-A. Mm -hmm. These are all really great songwriters and singers. Um, actually, there's a, a, a person who... Um, he's, don't, he's, forget John, uh, don't forget John McCutcheon. Right, John McCutcheon. Uh, Mary Chapin Carpenter who um, she's considered a, a country singer because she had a couple of country hits, but she started out in the little folk clubs in Washington, D.C. herself. Um, who else? Uh, yeah, Art, who do you play on your radio show? You know, I, I play a cross-section of everything. You know, at the radio show, what I do is I pick a theme, and then I play music that's associated with the theme. A lot of it is old time folk music that, I mean, old time country music that you've forgotten about from the 20s and the 30s. And I'll go so far as to play a, a, a piece from Bing Crosby or anybody that uh, associates. What I try to do is, 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 is assemble a patchwork of music that kind of fleshes out a particular scene. This coming this coming uh, week's show is going to be based on, I'm calling it Whistle While You Work. Um, the whole concept <laughs> of getting back to work and how important work has been in our culture. And I've got, I've got things from Pete Seeger all the way to Tom Waits. Um, 
Uh, if you've never heard Tom Waits sing Whistle While You Work from the Disney film, you're missing something. <laughs> Wow, that sounds amazing. Wow, but you know, but 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 that that, that that's what that's what I'm doing. And I, and just to accentuate what David is saying is, here in Southern California, we've got a rich community of folk singers, of people who are writing songs every day. And I don't know if they consider themselves songwriters. They, I, I mean, folk singers. They consider themselves singer songwriters. I mean, yeah. Tracy Newman, who was a folk singer back in 1961, who's a close friend of mine. Tracy Newman took off a few years and ended up getting an Emmy for writing Ellen DeGeneres' show and Cheers and all of those TV shows. And now she's exclusively back to writing folk songs and her songs are charming, beautiful and educated. Um, so they're all over it. Southern California. Mm -hmm. like, I, I can't even name them on the on fingers of all of my hands and toes. But Our, when, when can people hear your show coming up? Is it this Saturday, coming week? Well, we're, we're on the air Saturday morning. This Saturday morning at 6 a.m. I'm in the process of assembling it. I'm not going to go into the studio. I'm going to have one more session where I pre-record it here at home. Um, 6 a.m. on KPFK, 90.7 FM, Los Angeles. But if uh, anybody wants to sleep late or has something else to do at 6 o'clock um, on Saturday morning, uh, it's archived on the uh, kpfk.org page just look for the archive section and it's there for 14 days the entire show you can listen to it anytime at your leisure great so have you got a one minute song to close us out today well, i'll sing a verse of a song that i was associated with back in the back in the uh, 60s um i think you you might remember it um i was the arranger on this i sang in it i uh, I've sung it on the road 4,000 times, and I'm going to play it on my guitar, which is the 1958 Goya, which, uh, as I had mentioned, I'm going to have Judy sing with me. And I think you'll recognize it, and just fade me out whenever you like, Phil, okay? <laughs> okay. Today, while the blossoms still cling to the vine, I'll taste your strawberries, I'll drink your sweet wine. A million tomorrows shall pass away, ere I forget all the joy that is mine today. The song that I sing. I'll feast at your table, I'll sleep in your clover. Who cares what tomorrow shall bring? Today, while the blossoms still cling to the vine, I'll taste your strawberries, I'll drink your sweet. A million tomorrows shall all pass away Ere I forget all the joy that is mine today I can't be contented with yesterday's glories can't live on promises winter to spring today is my moment and now is my story i'll laugh i'll cry i'll sing today while the blossoms still cling to the vine I'll taste your strawberries, I'll drink your sweet wine. A million tomorrows shall all pass away, ere I forget all the joy that is mine. Thank you so much, Art. 
Thank and, you. And so thank much. you all, Art and David and, and uh, Cantor Phil. That was wonderful. Um, can't thank you.